Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another broadcast or podcast of the Pest Geek Podcast family. So this is Living the Wildlife uh, edition, so we're happy to have you along. Uh, here it is snowing, uh, well not snowing at the moment, but we've had a lot of s some snow up here in uh, central Montana, and I know that snow is certainly moving in a lot of other parts of the country as well as we're getting closer toward Thanksgiving is when I'm recording this particular presentation. So we're glad to have you on board and love to get your emails and uh, comments about the court, about our training here. And so you can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. That's wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you if you have some suggestions for the podcast or if you have uh, criticisms or even praise. If you're willing to share that, we'd love to get that as well. Definitely reach out to me as I say when I'm doing my presentations for my day job. As I says, I am the most available person on the planet. If you can't get a hold of me, I'm dead. So, but in any event, we're Hope you're as you're driving along, you're paying attention here because I figured today I would talk about hantavirus. And so, hantavirus, you've probably heard of it. You're probably somewhat concerned about it. Certainly, those of those of us who live uh, west of the Mississippi River, it is something. It's a disease that we should definitively be concerned about because those involved in wildlife control and pest control need to be cognizant of this particular zoonotic infection. So hantavirus is a serious, serious condition. So let's talk a little bit about it. I'm not a, I'm not a medical doctor, so the information I'm getting is from the CDC and other readings that I have done. So things are evolving all the time in the medical community, but this is sort of the information that sort of spin standard. Some of this information hasn't changed much for probably 10 or 15 years, give or take. Uh, so uh, definitely something you wanna be careful of. And of course, when we're always dealing with wildlife or in enclosed crawl spaces or attics or places where we're confined, and we're dealing with potentially hazardous materials, sometimes we can't always see those hazards, we always want to think about universal precautions, and that is always wearing gloves, always protecting yourself in terms of, should I be wearing a respirator? If you're asking that question, the answer is yes, 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 you should be wearing a respirator. Ideally, it should be a full face respirator, HEPA filter, and as one individual says, he likes to have organic filters on it as well, but certainly you want to have uh, HEPA filter, uh, HEPA filters on your full face, properly fitted, properly seal tested respirator. Uh, they're keeping track of how long these rest, you know, how long your filters have been running. You know, so you're putting some dates on them, and you're handling your equipment properly, and you're putting it on properly, you're taking it off properly. And so you always want to do that in a clean area before you open the hatch door to the dirty area, okay? So those are standard safety precautions that you should always be using whenever you're dealing with situations like this. So let's talk a little bit about uh, hantavirus in terms of what it is and I'm gonna just pull over something for the screen here so you can stop looking at me and so we're gonna pull over a, an article from the it's called the MMWR which is the morbidity mortality weekly report so this is a essentially it's, it's a journal article published by the Centers for Disease Control and so this is where they come out with additional information on a weekly basis about different cases that have occurred sometimes they've occurred in the US sometimes they've occurred elsewhere to try to help public health officials and medical doctors try to keep pace with the vastly changing aspects of public health care and about various diseases and so this information comes out all every week you can subscribe to it I believe if you want to or but it's always available online this is your tax dollars at work and so it's not free one of my pet peeves is when government officials tell us stuff is free nothing the government does is free 
and any moron who tells you that it is free is lying to you or they're trying to grab a vote by making you think that something is free all right that's my political statement there for it's really irritating when public officials yap their jaws and say stuff is free because i guarantee you we're paying their salary okay so that is something that if you need to teach your children because a lot of kids today don't understand that free is not free all right, so definitely keep that in mind. So this is an article published in 2002. It's a little dated, but some of the information is certainly going to be still valuable for us. And so basically, it's an updated list of recommendations for risk reductions. And so let me give you the full bibliographic citation for those of you who are riding along and not able to watch the screen. I'm not going to give all the authors because there's a bunch of them. But the first author is James N. Mills, and he's a Ph.D., and again, this was published in 2002, July 26th, volume 51, pages 1 through 12. And this was published in MMR, excuse me, MMWR, which is Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, published by the CDC. And the title of the article is Hantavirus Pulmonary Syndrome, United States Updated Recommendations for Risk Reduction. So we're not going to read the entire article here for you, but we're wanting to kind of give some information. So this is what it tells us, and that is originally hantavirus was discovered in the United States in 1993. And you might have heard of this as the Four Corners virus. It kind of really hit, I think this was during the Clinton administration, and this this really exploded on the news scene. I mean, this, there was a lot of concern because people in the Four Corners area, that you know, it's where Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and I think Colorado all meet in one spot, I believe. Um, don't quote me on the on the states there, but in terms of but that's it's the spot where you can actually stand. I've stood there. You can stand, and you're actually standing in four states at the same time. It's pretty cool. But it's in that general area where people were coming down with these massive lung infections, and they were some of them were rather young, and they were this typically pneumonia is an illness of elderly people, and these people were dying and so imagine that with all the medical technology that we have here in the United States and you have young healthy people and they're dying of this of this infection so researchers were scrambling trying to figure out what what this was and so it turned out ultimately it was identified as what's called hantavirus and it was actually called the Sinombra virus which means no name virus and so there was a lot of work done in this and was finally extracted, but the death rate of infection of this particular virus was 37%. So you can see figures, sometimes you'll see 38%, sometimes you'll see 33%, but in the, as of this publication, it was 37%. Reading that I've done since this, it's really up around 30, it's 37 plus percent. So imagine that in a modern era that we have here with all the medical technology, that if you contract this particular virus, you can you have a 38 percent chance of dying if it's then and it's hard to really grasp that number because we don't know how many people have been exposed to the virus and their body fought it off so we can only look at those people that have sort of been diagnosed with antivirus and have had medical treatment so it's so the number of of infections and death are probably less than that but the point is is that if you get sick and you need medical attention at that point and they identify that you've been infected with hantavirus at that point you have a 37 to 38 percent chance of dying okay that's some serious stuff so if we had uh, data which we don't have about all the people that have been infected with it and maybe their bodies fought it off maybe that death rate obviously would be significantly less however we don't have that information so how do you calculate an unknown we don't know so there's so much we don't know about this virus which is why we as professionals have to be careful because we are exposing ourselves more frequently than the average American we're crawling through places where mice live and that's the problem. So let's learn a little bit more about hantavirus. So <clears throat> all the hantaviruses, and there's you know there's sort of a constellation it seems of these because they're also, they also this virus also exists in different forms in other states. So it can cause two different types of infection. 
HPS, which is Hantavirus Pulmonary Syndrome, like obviously pulmonary, it's affecting your lungs, but there's also Hantavirus Renal Syndrome where the virus affects the kidneys. Typically, the ones that I've heard about are always tend to be Hantavirus Pulmonary Syndrome, but understand there is a version of this disease that can affect the kidneys as well. So several of these hantaviruses, like I said, there's a constellation, they tend to occur in rodents, that, where rodents tend to be the ones carrying this particular disease. Now, what's the percentage of rodents that carry this? Well, we're really only dealing with deer mice, that's Paramiscus manicolatus, white-footed mouse, which is Paramiscus leucopus, the cotton rat, I don't know the scientific name of the cotton rat, and I believe there's another another rat that also can carry this particular uh, disease. But these are the ones that are the primary carriers in the United States. What about Norway rats or house mice or roof rats? Well, there has been some evidence. Uh, I don't think it was in this particular journal article, but I think it was another one that I read that said there have been some indications where the Norway rat can contract hantavirus, but it seems to be unclear as the ability of the rat to transmit it and shed it through its urine. So this is what happens. When a rodent contracts this disease, the rodent's fine. It seems like the rodents have no symptoms of contracting this disease. However, as the virus is replicating inside of them, it, they shed the virus through their feces, through their urine, and through their saliva. So how do you catch hantavirus? Well, you catch it by either getting bitten by an infected rodent. This is why you're always wearing your gloves, right? When people, I get, it drives me nuts when I see people barehanding, barehanding animals. That's really, really silly. The other, uh, the other way you can get it is when you're stirring up the feces and dried urine. Of course, you're not going to see the urine, right? It's already been dried. Where you're stirring up that contaminated dust and then you breathe it. So most infections with hantavirus are caused by disturbing contaminated surfaces and you aerosolize that debris. When you aerosolize it, you inhale it. Remember I talked about that respirator you're supposed to be wearing. That's why you're wearing the respirator, right? So you have to be careful. So when people are contracting this disease, there is a relationship with people. You know, they're cleaning out sheds. They may have gone to a... Uh, a wood pile and maybe they saw a mouse nest in there and they just sort of grab it with their bare hands and pull it out. Well, what does that do? That aerosolizes all of that contaminated material. Or maybe they go into a cabin that they've winterized and then they're there in the spring and they walk in and there's all these mouse droppings on the floor and then they sweep it up. Or you're crawling through a crawl space that's contaminated with rodent droppings and rodent urine. Because remember, wherever there's droppings, there's urine. You just can't see the urine. And they're not properly protected, and they are aerosolizing this. Now, there is a question as to whether the hantavirus can infect us through cuts and scratches. They're not sure. This is part of the part of the problem with this, right? We we don't know that there. One article I read said it's they believe it's possible to contract hantavirus through an open wound, but they didn't think that it was a very common way or a very easy way. So this is the problem with when you're dealing with medical science, right? You have we know you can contract it this way. Are there other ways to contract it? Well. And then they have to try to evaluate how strong is the virus, how well, how well does it enter the bloodstream, and these types of questions. And there's a lot of variables going on there, right? So they, we don't know. So don't, you know, if you have cuts on your skin, and this is what a Tyvek suit's for, right? If you're crawling around, this is what knee pads are for, so that you're not cutting yourself or you're not exposing yourself. I would just encourage you, if you have open, open cuts and wounds, 
make sure you're having those things band-aided because you know there's other other organisms in a crawl space that you need to worry about right so when we talk about disease with with uh, wildlife control operators or PCO but sometimes we get a little fixated about certain diseases and that's understandable because we often know a little bit more about those diseases but I don't want you to get tunnel vision and say you know that your only fear is hantavirus no there's a lot of other things that are in crawl spaces and with animals that we need to be concerned about I'm not trying to create paranoia here, but we, we sometimes get a little cavalier in our work. And so we want to make sure we're responsible and we're acting appropriately. Wearing gloves, wearing your full face respirator HEPA filter, and you're wearing those items before you're going into enclosed spaces or buildings that have been locked up for long periods of time, before you're opening up drop ceilings, before you're going into attics, before you're going into, you know, dark, dank basements, or when you're going under decks, right? Those are absolutely critical areas for you to use. That's If you walk into an area and you're seeing, you know, droppings all over the floor, back out. Get your equipment on. So those are the things you need to be doing right off the bat. Now, is there more that you can do about this particular virus? The answer is yes. So let's give you a few scenarios about how you can proceed. Let's say you are, well, let me hold on there, there a moment. So we have this particular article. I'll scroll back up again. There is, there's the cover. I want to show you, you may say, Stephen, how, how common is this disease? How many people are really getting infected? Well, you know, that's a fair question, right? So here's the information. This is the latest data from... Uh, the CDC and I, for some reason, thinking that we're there, I, that there is another map that comes up to 2019, but it didn't come up on my search because I believe I have 2019 in one of my PowerPoints. But nevertheless, this is useful, even though it's three years old. Uh, so take a look here. Now you'll notice that the vast majority of infections are west of the Mississippi River. Why that is, um, I can't say, but that doesn't mean that there are no cases east of the Mississippi River, okay? Look, we have one up here in Rhode Island, we have one up in Connecticut, we got one up in Maine, a couple in Vermont, but where I'm at in Montana, we had 43. I think the actual number today is 47, okay? So look at down here in the Four Corners region, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, right? So look at these folks. This is ridiculous. This is a hot spot here for hantavirus, okay? California has a lot. Of course, it's a very big state. Kansas had 16. <clears throat> so these are some serious situations. And so even though Montana has only a population of, what, 1.1 million people, we are in the we're up there we're holding our own with 40 with 47 infections now <clears throat> but this is serious and so the why are all these people contracting it well we have deer mice out here and we certainly have white-footed mouse now the white-footed mouse does not have the complete range of the deer mouse the deer mouse has, covers almost the entire country not quite, but pretty close in terms of its geographical distribution. The white-footed mouse only comes to about the eastern third, eastern half of Montana. So it tend, doesn't have quite the range of the deer mouse. Obviously, cotton rats, if you're down in the south area, the cotton rat can also spread this particular infection. So the research suggests that about 10% of these animals carry hantavirus. Now that number is going to, you know, obviously vary. So it's like a lottery. You don't know whether this particular deer mouse has hantavirus or whether it doesn't have hantavirus. So you're going to practice those universal precautions. You don't know if that white-footed mouse has hantavirus. At the present time, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that suggests that house mice, mus musculus, carries this particular infection. Likewise with the roof rat, for those of you in roof rat areas. I did mention earlier that the Norway rat has been found to have to become infected with the virus, but it seems to be remarkably rare 
And then the question is, is can the, the rat then transmit the virus, shed it for us to be infected? Kind of an open question. So how do we protect ourselves? Treat all rodents as potential vectors of hantavirus, period. Now, whether they are or not, okay, because they carry other stuff that can be worried about. Now, I'm not one to hype medical issues, right? I don't think it's responsible for us as professionals to, to, to scare people to try to get the job. However, I, as I was talking to a health official just the other day, or someone who was trained in, in uh, she was a, has a master's degree in public health, I was explaining to her, I said, I'm not as worried about the client with some of these diseases as I am about the technicians. And the reason is, is because the technician is, is more likely to be going into places the homeowner wouldn't be going. Now, it doesn't mean that the homeowner is magically safe, but it's a matter of exposure. Most homeowners are not crawling through their attics. They're not crawling in their crawl spaces. They're not going underneath their decks and stirring up the dirt, right? That's something that we do as wildlife control professionals or pest control professionals. So you're at a greater risk. So you have got to be cognizant of these diseases. And my point is, is even if hantavirus, let's say you're deal, you, you know you're dealing with house mice because you've looked at them, you know you're not seeing those sharply defined white bellies, you need to understand that mice, and, mice can carry other diseases besides hantavirus, right? So if you're protecting yourself against hantavirus, you're pretty much protecting yourself against a lot of other things that can harm you, okay? So this is what universal precautions is all about. It's like, we're going to treat everything as dangerous so that we're protected from everything. Now, does that cost you money? Yes. Does that cost you time? Yes. But how much time are you going to lose if you're on your back because you're struggling for your life with a serious infection? I'll let you answer that question. So notice... Hantavirus is pretty much across the country. And why these other states don't haven't had any positives? Got me. It could be an issue of maybe they people recovered, maybe they moved, who knows, right? But the point is it's pretty broad distribution in terms of the United States. And notice the data here. 96% of all the cases with hantavirus occur west of the Mississippi River. So those of us in the West have to be particularly careful. Okay. Doesn't mean the East is off the cook here. It just means, statistically speaking, we're more likely to catch it. Now, why is that? Well, <clears throat> I have a theory about that. For whatever, for whatever it's worth, let me throw it out there in terms of my particular hypothesis. Right? A lot of people in Western states have cabins and, for hunting. And those cabins are obviously going to be shut up for long periods of time until people come out and, and start getting them ready for whether it be the spring season or whether it be for hunting season. So those build structures are obviously very uh, attractive to rodents, right? Like deer mice like to live inside of buildings. It's much better than probably a tree. So when they walk in, they see these specks on the floor and they, oh, I got, I got mouse droppings here. I got to clean up. And so then they sweep these, build these buildings up rather than and then they inhale that and then they get an infection. So this is, you know, this is what my, my theory is, or there also is a lot more interaction between the public and nature than what would occur in the more industrialized, more urbanized Eastern states. Okay. Now don't think for one minute that deer mice don't live in cities because they can and they do, right? So don't think that they don't. However, I, it's, you know, it's all about concentration. It's all about levels here. So how do you, what do you do if you come onto a situation where you see droppings on the, mouse droppings on the floor? Now, can you distinguish deer mice droppings from house mice droppings? The answer is no, you can't. It's without using DNA, it's not really going to be practical. There's no real key diagnostic for you to distinguish deer mice droppings from house mouse droppings okay you should be checking your catch when you're catching mice you should know the difference between a deer mouse and a house mouse 
right? What I recommend for people to do is they look at the tail. With a deer mouse, it's a very clean white to brown. Where a, where a house mouse, it's not. House mice tend to have a much more dull gray stomach, and then it kind of blends into the brown back. Where deer mice, it tends to be white and then brown. It doesn't have that fading change. It's almost like someone drew a line and then created that, uh, you know, painted white in one spot and then painted brown in another. House mice, it's more of a gray and a dull. Deer mice tend to have buggier eyes and have more enlarged eyes and their ears seem to be a little bit bigger because they're primarily nocturnal. House mice are nocturnal as well, but house mice are much more willing to go out during the daytime. And being a woodland creature, because deer mice are native species to the United States, right? So it's not like they're non-native species, they are native. You know, they're trying, deer mice are trying to avoid predators, right? So you gotta have eyes and they're coming out at night and they gotta be able to see things pretty well, right? So it's a, that's deer, that's a deer mouse. And so definitely learn what the differences are and you should be checking your catch. So that way, if you're catching deer mice, maybe if you've been a little careless, they you say, oh, I maybe need to pay attention, but you also need to record that you've been catching deer mice because how long does it take for the infection to show up? Let's say you were exposed and you, you're gonna become sick. How long does it take? Great question. Researchers aren't quite clear because knowing when people were initially infected is also unclear. The theory is, is that you tend to have symptoms within five weeks. Now, do you remember what you did five weeks ago? This is why you have to have good records, right? If you start getting, start getting sick, and this is a, usually a massive fever, and you start getting some difficulty breathing, and your blood, oxygen sats go way down, you also have a lot of pain in the upper shoulders area, which makes sense because you're probably coughing your lungs out, okay? Don't ignore this stuff, right? This is why you need to be telling your medical facility, medical doctor, hey, I work with wildlife. You, know, you need to be thinking about something. Don't just simply always push off things that it's always the flu because it may not be the flu one of these times, right? So make sure family members understand where your records are. If you start getting sick and say, oh yeah, I did a big mouse job and we were catching deer mice five weeks ago. Could it be? I don't know. It may take a test for you to find out if it was hantavirus, but at least you're not putting your doctor, in, you're not keeping your doctor in the dark. Inform your doctor of what's going on because they're not automatically thinking, oh, he's got, a, he's got pneumonia, it must be hantavirus. That's not what they're thinking. They're thinking it's the flu or you have a really bad cold or maybe COVID at this point or who knows what it is, right? So be sure your doctor and family members are up to speed on some of this, right? I know it's scary, I know it's, I, but do the thing, because if it's sort of like, like my, my wife said, you know, she threw a shovel in the back of the truck. This way we, we have the sho shovel so we don't need it. Well, it's the same way with your medical care, right? You tell people about the potential risks so that they never have to need the information, right? I know it's a little bit of voodoo type thing, but it's just sort of funny how that is. And so by being aware and making your medical providers aware that if it is legit, if you do have antivirus, they're gonna find it faster. And that can only be good for you. So, you're wearing your respirator, you're wearing your Tyvek, you're wearing your gloves. What do you do if you're walking into a building? And let's say you weren't wearing that material. You walk into this, this cabin, you're like, oh my goodness, there's all these droppings on the floor, what do you do? First thing you do is you back out of the building, but you leave the door open. The CDC suggests that if a building has been closed for a long period of time, you air the building out for at least 30 minutes. I read another publication that said you air it out for an hour. Ideally, you wanna have cross breeze, and the idea being is that Hantavirus is an aerosolized virus. It can be aerosolized into the air. You wanna reduce the viral load in that atmosphere. Then what do you do? Then you can put on your safety equipment and then you can walk in with a spitzer bottle and spray down the floor 
with either a bleach solution of one part bleach to nine parts water. Make sure you're using fresh bleach or you can use a common disinfectant. I wasn't able to get a list of what disinfectants they were recommending, but I think Lysol is certainly one of them. You may be able to use other things like maybe the maybe ammonia, uh, but you want to have common household disinfectants and you can then spray that onto the floor and you let you want to make sure the floor is wet. So if you're seeing a dropping or you're seeing a nest or you're seeing contaminated area, you spray the material, spray the disinfectant until those items are wet and soaked. Now be careful with bleach, right? Bleach can stain. So that that is a problem, but you gotta think about this. Never vacuum, never sweep. Now some of you are saying, but Stephen, I have a HEPA filter vacuum. If you trust it, I, I just haven't gotten enough confidence to trust those things yet. I'm happy to have my mind changed, but I just can't trust it because what happens if there's a leak? Now you're spewing that contaminated material out into the air. So I would be a little concerned about that. So how do you clean up? You're going to wet mop and clean everything up with a wet mop. And be sure you're using a disinfectant in the liquid as well as you're cleaning up. Right? Some states, if you're doing this professionally, if you're cleaning up someone's, someone's area professionally, some states are going to require you to have a pest control license because you're performing a pesticidal cleaning service. Other states may not require that, so you need to make sure you're checking to make sure you're legal in that particular area. So another question that comes up and says, Stephen, how long does the virus last outside of the deer mouse? So let's say a deer mouse is you know, walking across this table and it defecates. How long, and doesn't add any fresh material, right? Obviously, if it, if it adds fresh material, the, the clock starts again, right? But if it has, doesn't have fresh material, how long, how long will it take for that virus to die? Well, it's unclear. They've done some laboratory studies trying to model this, and the best guess is that the virus would be dead in about a week. And I think I had some actual temperature data here. If I can pull this up here, if I can find it. How long does it last outside of the body? Well, let me do another, let me do another quick search here. Here we go. Let's see. So out of the Pennsylvania government, they say two to three days at normal room temperature, it will survive. I've read it can go out to five to seven days. It does appear that hantavirus does degrade. It means that the virus dies relatively quickly in the presence of sunlight. That is UV radiation is killing that particular virus. So viruses often have a protein coat around them. And so you, when you degrade that protein coat, that's what allows that virus to become no longer infectious. So if someone is able to keep their keep an area mouse free and at a normal room temperature, Obviously, if it's too cold, you're going to basically prever preserve the virus. So if it's at normal room temperature, seven days, that virus should be dead. Now, dead. So this is what explains for us why more people don't contract this disease, right? This makes more sense. Because if the virus, if people are trapping mice and they're killing the mice or poisoning the mice and there's no additional shed material, well, every day that goes by, there's less virus alive to infect somebody that makes that makes sense so there's sort of a, a clock on how long this virus will last outside of the organism problem is when in our type of work we don't know how long ago that virus was shed how long that dropping was there when that dropping was put dropped there by a deer mouse or a white-footed mouse or a cotton rat right so we don't know so this is what that universal precautions are for 
I hope this is helpful for you. I hope it helps remind you again the importance of protecting yourself. Wildlife control, pest control is a dangerous job. I do hope you're being properly compensated, that you're charging enough for the type of work you do. Obviously, hantavirus is not nuclear, you know, it's not plutonium, it's not, you know, it's not nuclear, but it is dangerous, right? So, but we have the tools and we have the knowledge to protect ourselves. We just got to make sure we do it. And then when you're finished, I'm always going to recommend when you, when you finish your job for the day, this should be a habit you should get in. You should be showering and having your clothes put in the wash separately before you're hugging your children because you don't know what kind of contaminants are on your clothing. Even if you're wearing a Tyvek suit, you don't know, right? So you want to be thinking about how you can contaminate yourself by not cleaning up properly. And so I would encourage you to just get into the habit of showering at the end of each workday, putting on fresh clothes, making sure your work clothes are in the laundry separate, put them in the hot water cycle and the hot, you know, and, and make sure they're cleaned thoroughly in isolation from other pieces of laundry before your kids are coming up and hugging you. That's important. So because there's more to the world than hantavirus that can hurt us in wildlife control. And we're still learning about the types of diseases we can be in, uh, affected by and the types of contaminants we can be affected by. So we want to act in a prudent, cautious, not paranoid, but a prudent, cautious way. Monitor your health. Tell your family, tell your physician what work you do and remind your physician all the time what kind of work you do. Remember that little card? You might have seen that in some of the work that I've done. That's a card you can get from uh, Google it online. I'll put it, in the, I'll put it in at the end of this particular video for those of you that want to get one. It's important. So I'm Stephen Van Tassel. Wildlife Control Consultant, another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the uh, Pest Geek Podcast family. We'd love to hear from you, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. If you have ideas, show if we're always looking for people to interview. You have a new product, you have a new book, you have a new technique, you have just something you want to say to the to the audience out here in wildlife control and pest control land, we would love to hear from you and re just reach out. Living the wildlife, this is, why do we want you to live the wildlife? We want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. That's what this pest, that's what the Pest Geek Podcast is all about. I'm Stephen Van Tassel. Take care.